Hi folks, uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the unique properties of the Krebs cycle, um, and specifically some cool properties that uh, give it a very unique ability to convert between different kinds of substrates, right? So um, it is a cycle um, and it, it can roll either way most of the time. Remember a lot of the, these uh, arrows um, in the cycle are reversible. And that means that a lot of what we can do um, in terms of uh, synthesis actually uh, can be reversed, right? And so the cycle can roll each way. So remember that that's what we call uh, amphibolic. And the word bolic here comes from both catabolic and anabolic. Uh, and that means that we're able to use the cycle to both build new things and also to break things down. So if we're doing catabolism, uh, we're breaking things down. That's the normal production of NADH uh, from the Krebs cycle. But we, all can, we can also take a lot of these kinds of things off the cycle, right? Um, and so kind of another concept is that this, uh, this several reactions are what we consider uh, anaplerotic. or catapleurotic, which means uh, if you think about Anna being building, uh, this would be cycle building or cycle filling. So we can fill in the cycle with certain reactions and then catapleurotic would be cycle taking or taking things off the cycle. Now, one of my favorite things to do uh, and to see is uh, particular kind of sushi restaurant where sushi kind of runs around on this belt around the restaurant and you can google this on youtube they're really cool to see and essentially uh, you just take whatever you want off of the off the belt um, or you can order and it comes to you on the belt um, and you can just kind of take off and put your stuff um, and then the, the kitchen's going to put uh, the dishes on the belt you're taking it off and so that would be an example of catapleurotic where we're taking things off the belt, uh, or anaplerotic, where we're, the kitchen is putting things on the belt. And so you can always be taking off and putting on. And so a number of these reactions are uh, what we consider anaplerotic, uh, which is cycle filling. We saw one of these when we were talking about pyruvate carboxylase in gluconeogenesis. I'm going to color code these yellow for cycle filling. Um, and remember that what's happening here is we're making the OAA that we need to do uh, to start the reactions of the Krebs cycle, right? Pyruvate is all you need to be able to start the Krebs cycle. We can make it into acetyl-CoA using the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, um, which is, of course, um, important to make start the, the cycle. We give off that CO2 to do that. We can also make OAA, which is the other reactant using pyruvate carboxylase. And so an anaplerotic reaction here is when we're gonna be filling in the cycle, okay? Um, and anaplerotic reactions are really important here because a lot of times, if you take things, something off, you're skipping part of the cycle and making it so that you ha you're gonna have to start all over again, unless you have um, some sort of anaplerotic reaction to fill in that gap. Now, we've already talked about ways that this can happen. For example, I told you that uh, we could enter the cytoplasm from citrate. Uh, we've talked about how citrate is actually a regulator of a bunch of different kinds of, of situations. And so we can enter the cytoplasm with our uh, citrate, right? And then this will be made into a bunch of different compounds such as malonyl-CoA. Uh, oops, sorry, let's, let's, I don't wanna skip a step here. Uh, when we get this out here, we can break it up into acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate okay, uh, in the cytoplasm. And then the acetyl-CoA becomes malonyl-CoA. And then we use that to make fatty acids. And then the OAA out here can be used to make uh, things like aspartic acid. And if you think about the structure of OAA, versus something like aspartic acid, the only difference is the fact that OAA has a carbonyl uh, at the alpha position here versus a H2N, okay? And so these are typically called amino transferase enzymes. And we're gonna see one of these when we get into uh, the 
electron transport chain being used to actually transport OAA out of the cytoplasm and then to be used to, to cycle it around. Aspartic acid is actually a very important carrier of carbons for a lot of these things, but they're cousins. They have the same number of of carbons, the same carbon backbone. The only change is that you have now gotten rid of the carbonyl and replaced it with an H2N, uh, which is called a reductive amination. Okay, uh, and going back the other way would be a oxidative deamination. Okay, um, this happens a lot. So imagine what we're going to have here: um, the cytoplasm. If we were going in this different direction. Um, if we're going out into the cytoplasm, uh, we would be doing a cataplerotic reaction. We're going to be taking off the cycle, right? So in this direction here, we'd be going cataplerotic, but we could also take citrate back in and we'd be anaplerotic, right? And so a lot of these cycles can run either way, okay? So it's kind of an important concept that we can do anaplerotic and cataplerotic reactions depending on which side is taking and which side is giving, okay? Now, kind of coming back around to this aspartic acid OAA thing. Um, OAA comes here, uh, our aspartic acid and also asparagine can enter the cycle as OAA, right? Uh, which would be a cycle filling reaction. Because again, those are cousins. Uh, or we could take them off just like we showed over there and do a cycle taking reaction, a cataplerotic reaction. Uh, to make aspartic acid, right? Uh, and use that for, for building up, right? We'd be using those to make new uh, proteins. Okay. Now, other amino acids can be gener generated straight off of the uh, Krebs cycle, such as here with alpha-ketoglutarate. Uh, I think about glutarate glutamate. I'm going to draw this the same way I've drawn it here. This is glutamic acid or glutamate. Uh, and glutamate can enter the cycle or be taken off the cycle um, to make amino acids or to fuel the cycle, right? So uh, for example, say that you don't eat a lot of carbohydrates, uh, you eat a mostly meat diet for carnivorous animals and for a lot of humans too, uh, that's very common. Uh, and for them, you would want to be necessarily uh, filling in the cycle with an anaplerotic reaction of the glutamic acid that you're taking in to make that alpha-ketoglutarate. And remember that alpha-ketoglutarate essentially is the is the key thing that's going to start making us all the paydays, right? Um, we, we lost one NADH here, but it, from there on out, we're, we're getting quite a lot of, of yield out of an amino acid. Of course, we could always, if we need to make new proteins, we could take off through alpha-ketoglutarate. And the cool thing about this is that a lot of different um, amino acids actually can filter through this um, in uh, a pathway that... It, just like we saw up here with aspartic acid. Oops, sorry. That's where we're at. With aspartic acid, we can also for use the amino acids asparagine, uh, glutamine, or not asparagine, glutamine, arginine, histidine, and proline can enter the cycle through gluten glutamic acid, okay? So a number of these guys are gonna be filling in the cycle, okay? That's kind of an important concept. Now, other ones come in here through succinyl-CoA. Uh, the amino acids, threonine, isoleucine, methionine, and valine enter through succinyl-CoA, okay? And we can also uh, essentially break them down for energy there. Um, fumarate over here on the side. Fumarate allows us to take in tyrosine, phenylalanine, um, and again, we've already talked about aspartic acid and, oh, and uh, asparagine coming in here. Okay. So we're filling in that cycle in all these different ways. Now, if you're filling in the cycle like this, you can end up building up extra OAA, right? So imagine that you have extra OAA and you have more OAA than you need, right? A common thing that you can do with that OAA, again, is to make a PEP, right? Remember that we see uh, 
the decarboxylase Pepsi K, where we lose the CO2, but we use a GTP, uh, and we burn GDP as a, as a result. And then PEP goes upstream to make glucose, right? And so these amino acids that fill in through these sides are what are called glucogenic amino acids. Right? So all these ones that fill in the cycle are glucogenic. All of these guys can be glucogenic. Because they would result, because of how they're introduced into the cycle, uh, they would result in extra OAA, which means that we don't, you know, if we don't, we don't need that much OAA, we're going to take it off and make glucose out of it. So it's glucogenic. Okay. Now there's two amino acids that are what we call ketogenic. which means that they're either used to form fats uh, or they are burned up. Um, and it, this is from, you know, the idea of ketone bodies or ketosis or, you know, going, going, uh, taking specific diets, right? I'm going um, ketogenic, right? And this is where a lot of these kinds of fats get used. Um, and you might've heard about this from certain people. And these ones have to enter through the acetyl-CoA and these are the L's. Uh, lysine and leucine. Those are our ketogenic amino acids, right? Ketogenic means that they're burned up like acetyl-CoA. And remember, whenever acetyl-CoA comes in, we lose its CO2s in these two steps. And so we cannot use them to net synthesize uh, glucose because they're, the CO2s are lost, right? We can't, we can end up building up enough OAA to net synthesize glucose because we lose the two carbons that we added every time we run the cycle. And so we're, we're carbon neutral if we come in through acetyl-CoA. But if we come in through these other amino acids, then effectively what's happening is that we're building up more carbons, right? And so this is, for example, you know, if you're eating a meat-rich diet, you still have good blood glucose control because all of the amino acids that you take in are going to become glucose, right? Um, and we're not going to get quite as much yield out of it. And so this is the theory behind, you know, like Atkins diets or the Paleolithic diets um, where, uh, you know, amino, amino acids and proteins aren't worth quite as much energy as glucose because, you know, they're coming in uh, and losing a little bit of NADH most of the time. You're coming in later in the cycle, right? Not all the time, but on average, they're worth a little bit less. And so you might lose weight if you're eating appropriately sized portions of, of meat products or protein, right? Um, now, that's that's necessarily not easy to do, but it is the theory behind a lot of it, okay? So keep in mind that, the, that some of these guys are ketogenic. Now, the other ones, uh, some other ones can also be ketogenic. Uh, let's see, I can drive, do that in blue. Uh, and those are the FITs. So phenylalanine, I call it F because that's its, its letter, isoleucine, tyrosine, tryptophan, and threonine. Those can also go uh, ketogenic, right? So you can either be glucogenic or ketogenic. Tyrosine, uh, phenylalanine, let's see, where's the other one? Isoleucine, threonine, and let's see, where's the other one? Tryptophan, tryptophan, yeah. Um, tryptophan can come in as well. Um, so those ones can go both. And remember that anytime we're talking about these amino acids, um, if they fill the cycle as glucogenic amino acids, they end up building up OAA, which can be taken off into gluconeogenesis, right? So keep that in mind. Um, lots of these different things can be taken on and off. Um, and we can use this to make amino acids as well. And it's thought that the Krebs cycle was actually evolved originally as a system for interconverting amino acids, right? And it just so happened that we eventually, like the NADH, it produced so much that we use it more for energy now and less for amino acids. But you can imagine that this is actually a very useful pathway because it allows us to take in substrates of different types to uh, generate the intermediates that we can use for other processes. So it's a very flexible little pathway. And that's one of the coolest things about it. So. Uh, that's kind of where we're going to stop with the Krebs cycle. Uh, next thing we're going to start talking about is the electron transport chain. And remember here that complex two uh, is part of the electron transport chain, right? And so we're going to run into this guy here on the intermitochondrial membrane in just a second. Um, but keep
keep in mind that this these two cycles are in, inextricably linked. If electron transport can't, doesn't run, the Krebs cycle can't run, and vice versa, right? Um, and so keep keep in mind. Well, I guess the Krebs cycle can technically stop, but uh, most of the time they're inter they're interrelated and they're impossible to really uh, extricate from each other. So see you in the next video.